So the shortlist for the International Booker Prize came out a couple of days ago, I did a reaction to it, and I just have to say, first of all, I am super proud of the Booker for giving representation to bad books this year. That really felt like progress to me. Ninth Building, God, we hardly knew you. Look. Look at the master good, my boy. Yeah. There were only two of the books on the shortlist that I hadn't read already, uh, and I was able to read one of them without any issue pretty quickly, and that is the one we're going to review today, which is Time Shelter by Georgi Gospodinov. There's been a real bias in the last few years with the International Booker Prize in shortlisting or awarding books relating to, like, memory and time. Each art form have their own kind of, like, specialties that they do the best that others can't, so movies really get down to the subtleties of expression that literature just can't quite get to, and, you know, someone like Sally Rooney doesn't even try, but the subtleties of, like, dialogue and expression and, like, the physicality of a person is much better rendered in film. Uh, in poetry, you get more of, like, the emotion and the feeling of, of someone or a person. In music, you, like, drop a fat beat and you bend that ass down. I've always considered the one exception, um, for literature, the thing that literature does better than anything else, is, like, memory and time. Because I feel like the interiority of people is, is done well enough in other forms of media, but I feel like things like memory and time are expressed better in literature than anywhere else. I mean, look at something like Half-Blood Prince and how all the memory scenes are like tinged green and all the audio is like echoey and it's just shit, even though that's the best Harry Potter movie, but that's still shit. But it makes sense that some of the best books or things that people consider the best books, like Proust, are books that deal with memory and time. And now it's time to talk about the actual book I'm reviewing, instead of just ranting about a bunch of uh, nothing. So this book is about a person named Gostein, who's a friend of the narrator, and this person, Gostein, decides to open a clinic for people who want to escape the modern world and go back to the past, so he creates a room that's for like 1969, and he adds in a bunch of shit from 1969, and like smells and sounds and things like that, and then it starts getting used by like Alzheimer's patients, and people who want to feel the past again. This book is very similar to the movie Midnight in Paris, uh, or at least thematically to Midnight in Paris, which is pretty much one of my favourite movies ever. It's also quite similar to Synecdoche, New York, which is a movie I don't particularly like. Uh, but it's the most similar to a movie called La Belle Epoque, which is a 2020 French movie, which has literally an identical premise and kind of an identical resolution or an identical kind of understanding of how dangerous the past is and how much we tend to sugarcoat it. I found this book very sort of light on its feet and fun and full of like cultural reference and, and it was it was quite uh, meaty. But I think most of all it was like really deeply sad. That was the main thing I took away from it. It's not the kind of sad that I like where characters just get abused and there's trauma and everyone's getting murdered and everyone's crying and I'm just sitting there like a psychopath going <laughs> like in fucking A Little Life or something like that. Has it been literally every single video for the last, like, six videos where I've referenced A Little Life? I have such an unhealthy fucking hateful obsession with that book. But this book had the kind of sad that was, like, melancholic and depressing and was just kind of a downer. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I appreciate books that, that have the balls to go where this book kind of does in terms of the emotion it serves to the reader. There's a moment near the beginning where a mutual acquaintance of the narrator and Gostein, who's the man who opens up the clinic, um, this mutual acquaintance is, ha has Alzheimer's and he's reliving all of these bad memories that he used to have, all these like, th these like bad experiences that he associated with the past. And then when he finally dies, uh, you see a good memory that this man have had, or it's like a, um, it's like a final thing that he thinks, and it's like this very nice positive memory that I think involved his mother and stuff like that. And that was like really sad. It was a really like Debbie Downer moment, and it was like 50 pages in, and I was like, fuck, do we want to like back off the accelerator a little bit with how much you're going to make me miserable? This book teeters the line occasionally between being light on its feet and having that sort of sense of self-awareness and then trying for the profound sort of metaphorical, motivational quote that you'd put on a poster with, like, a picture of, like, the hills or some countryside, and up the top you say one of these quotes. We assume that the memory of happiness is a happy memory, but who knows? That's, like, something I get at the bottom of, like, my Google. I get little, uh, motivational quotes, uh, at the, at the bottom, um, of my Google that say, like, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And then another one could be like, the past is not just that which happened to you, sometimes it is that which you just imagined. You know, stuff like that. And, I, and it's fine to do that once or twice, and it is profound to do that every now and again, but this book does it a lot, and it got a little bit distracting, and it, and it made it feel 
for, for lack of a better word, definitely for lack of a better word, uh, pretentious. So the idea is that the experiment gets overtaken by how big and expansive life is, so the clinic that exists starts to occupy the whole building, and then it's like a whole block of buildings, and then eventually whole countries start to participate. And that was very similar to Synecdoche, New York, which is the Charlie Kaufman movie, and that movie does take itself too seriously, and it is very, um, self-serious self because Charlie Kaufman is annoying, uh, and I'm not particularly big on that movie, but this book does a better job at balancing the tone, at least for most of it, um, and when it starts to get into the kooky stages where it's like, okay, this is getting ridiculous, the book is at least aware of that and treats it more as, a, as an allegory. We had a separate zone at the end of the hallway, several apartments for the Eastern Bloc countries. The hallway between East and West was divided in the middle by an iron curtain, a massive wooden gate which was always locked and which only clinic personnel could pass through. It only took one escape attempt from the eastern hallway, a guy who tried to jump over the top of this mini Berlin wall, but fell and broke his leg. After that casualty, one of the orderlies patrolled the eastern side in old military uniforms. So, the where where the, the self-awareness comes in is in how how goofily realistic it starts to overtake history, so how much it starts to interrelate with history in a way that isn't intentional. That's where the goofiness comes in, and Synecdoche, New York doesn't do that, it just kind of goes, Oh, isn't dying sad? Oh. The absurdity of the premise is showing how much natural variation takes place in the real world, and also how much the author has clearly dwelled on the topic and made up these rules for how things would happen, kind of like a high fantasy universe, where he goes, all right, with this with this concept, how would it balloon out and, and to overtake the world? How would it do that? Specifically how? And the way that it does that is funny, and and kind and very self-aware, but also felt very kind of like trenchant and it felt like a real sort of that he'd really pondered over it and put a lot of like thought into it in like a political and a cultural sense. And obviously that becomes a lot more evident by the end of the book, which I'll get to in a bit. I, I split this book into thirds, and the book itself doesn't really do that, but I split it into thirds, and the second third is the worst third, and then the first and third thirds are really good. The first third is kind of the, the burgeoning of the clinic, the opening of it, and it's interspersed with narratives of Alzheimer patients that are coming to, to see it. Uh, and it's like, uh, an Alzheimer pa patient is having trouble remembering things and then they come there and they and it's reminded to them, or this Alzheimer pa is patient is getting reminded of bad things that happen and stuff like that, and that happens a few times and all that stuff is really sad and then it cuts back to the clinic where this kind of like goofy idea is coming out and it's good, it, it balances the tones really well. And then the second third, there's a, a section between like, I'd say page 120 and 190 that I genuinely don't remember and it's where it kind of starts, the clinic starts to overtake the country and they start to uh, ponder over what, what it's going to look like, and then uh, the country splits and they start to do a vote, a referendum, on which time period they as a country should return to, using this basically magical clinic. Uh, and, and it's a decision that's like, oh, we'll go back to socialist time, or we'll go back to this time, and then it splits into parties, and then the parties start to reenact history. And that happens for a little bit, but then there's a section in the middle where the narrator kind of just totally detaches and becomes unfocused, and they start to go to places and interact with people that did not feel connected, and it felt kind of boring. There's 70 pages of the book that I don't remember, which is ironic, uh, but probably not how I should be feeling. Then at the end of that 70 pages, there's like a recap where you see this is what ha was actually happening during the country. They did a referendum and the vote was really close, so they had to tie the vote and then they had to come to an agreement. And that all happens as like a debrief at the end of the 70 page segment. And I, when I read that, I went, wait, what did happen in the last 70 pages? Like, what the fuck I was reading and I, I, my brain had just turned off. And then after that point, my brain turned back on again and I loved everything after that. So I don't know what happened in the middle, but there was something, uh, there was, uh, maybe something important happened, but it was very boring, that middle bit. But the beginning and the end of the book are pretty, pretty solid, pretty fantastic. The Bulgarian referendum splits into political parties, and then they start to, like, fight, and then there's an uprising that fails, and it mirrors a historical uprising for a totally different premise that also failed. It's, it's kooky, it's a silly idea, the way that history repeats itself through this ridiculous, uh, magic realist idea that the author has. The way the book deals with Alzheimer's and memory is good, and it's a large portion of the book, but I wanted to see more of, like, the, the political and social side of it in a broader scale. And you get that at the end in kind of list form, which I'll get to, because I loved that. But I needed more of that from the Bulgarian perspective because I was kind of confused what the book was telling me when all of these people decide to go back and reenact the First World War and the Second World War. I was confused what 
not why they did that, but what point the author was making in saying that, in going to that extreme. I was kind of unsure if the author was commenting on his country, or on the world in general, or if he was just commenting on how memory feels nicer, uh, the, you sugarcoat the past, because then that's just the same premise as Midnight in Paris or La Belle Epoque. It's the same point that those movies make, and I don't know if the book was trying to say more than that. But I would say that everything was funny enough and um, well written enough that a lot of that didn't bother me, that the kind of point of the book was confusing me a little bit. And I would say that the kookiness of the book improves it and, and gives it more of that social relevance even when I was confused by what point I was meant to be taking from it. Yeah, so there's that uprising that's based on the referendum that fails and it mirrors the other one. Then they get actors to play revolutionaries and the narrator comes into this warehouse where one of these guys who's recruiting these actors are, and the narrator goes, oh wow, this could actually like fuck up our government, I don't know what I've done here. And that was a funny moment, I like that, where there's all these revolutionaries who are like training to like say uh, buzzwordy things, that was funny. Those who had wanted socialism received, as part of their free membership package, a ban on abortions and a deficit of feminine hygiene products. Those who hadn't wanted socialism also received this. It's super silly, the idea that to return to a nostalgic past, for nostalgic purposes, you have to reinstitute the governments that existed in that point to make it seem more realistic, and those governments fuck people up. So that was funny. Let's be clear, folks. This is... like, communist-level shit. So my favorite part of the book was when we get a list of other countries that decide to go back to the past, and they all conduct their own referendums. That was silly as fuck, and I love that. And it was so, um... Again, the author had clearly dwelled on it, and clearly turned it into his own uh, historical, sort of fantastical universe. He had clearly thought up this alternate timeline that life would take, where people vote on this, and why they would vote for certain things. I loved when he'd give the reasons as to why countries would vote on this, and he'd be like, well, in this country, the decision was actually pretty close between this era, because it was just after some, some, uh, some period of unrest, or this period, because it was also some golden age, and, and it was tossed up between this, and then the narrator would, uh, give his own opinions on this based on what he'd heard about the country, and that felt really well researched, like, the author had really gotten down to the zeitgeist of a country, and I loved all that, I was like, this has clearly been mulled over obsessively, these, like, 40, 50 pages, and I know some people got bored by that, because it is kind of in list form, but I was just loving it, I loved all of that, and I was more bored by the stuff where it felt like the author was trying to give a different point, uh, which is in that middle chunk, and I just don't remember any of it. During the 1970s and 80s, besides the Iron Curtain, the world was also split in two, in an equally categorical manner, by the question every man faced. The blonde or the brunette from ABBA? <laughs> I personally prefer the brunette. In the end, the 80s in Germany won out, except that Berlin once again had to become a divided city. Interestingly enough, both sides insisted on this. So it's just more goofy-ass ideas, and every country has a goofy-ass idea related to this. Italy has a goofy idea, I'm pretty sure Sweden had some goofy ideas. And all of that I would just leave for you to read for yourself, because it's great. It feels like a massive comedic payoff for the way the book has been building before that point. It's this comedic payoff of, now the whole world has contracted this nostalgic virus, and they all decide that they want to go back to these certain times, and the whole book then kind of has built to that point, and it felt a lot more satisfying when it reached that point, even if I had to get through a little bit of narrative stalling uh, in the middle chunk to get to it. Then at the end you see this map, and it's the map of the, the Europe, and which era they've decided to go to, and Britain isn't included because they had left the EU. <laughs> like, it's so silly, it's so weird, and I, and, I, and I love that that's where the book ends. Or not ends, but that's where the plot part of the book ends. Um, and that, that was great, and even though it felt a little, the book felt a little pretentious to the point where it was trying to make a broader, like, more thematically dense point, I liked it when it just did that, when it felt a little goofier and more like a kind of silly comedy based on this idea. Yeah, then the people who lose the referendums in their specific country start to rebel, and the past loses its kind of fun meaning, and then at the end of the book, the whole world kind of decides to redo the First World War and the Second World War, and so they do it on these mass scales and it all just happens again. And again, like, it's a goofy idea and it, and it makes sense that they've got into that point using the comedic logic of the book, but I was unsure what I was meant to take from that thematically. I was unsure why that was, like, the point of the book. But there's the second point which has to do with memory and the past, and that's where the book sort of ends itself on. 
and I liked that, and I'll get to that in a sec. The modern malaise that people feel, the kind of modern discontent, probably would be the point, but it felt like the book was more focused on Alzheimer's and um, the kind of sadness of losing memory, and the book is really obsessed with death. Like, the narrator is obsessed with the idea of losing memory and dying, and it's pretty grim. <laughs> so you contrast this goofy, like, Oh, um, Poland has decided to go to this point in time, and everybody was like, no, we don't want to do that, so then there were rebellions, and it reads like a silly, high fantasy lore, uh, but for the real world. And then you cut to, I'm very scared of dying, I met this man, and he's lost all of his memories, and he's going to die soon, and this is very sad. And that's the kind of duality the book sits on, and those two points... I don't feel like connect the right way. Perhaps that's a better way of putting it, is that the sadness of losing memory with kind of the ending of the book, uh, with what happens to the narrator, which I'll talk about in a sec, um, does not feel connected to the goofy ass, here's a map of which time everyone went to. There's a twist at the end that I did not like, but I loved everything after it, and the twist is that the guy who built the clinic, Gorstein, and the narrator are the same person, and I was like, Shut the fuck up with this Fight Club ass bullshit, right? And the way they reveal the twist is so dumb too, where he's like, Whoa, me and Gostein have the same handwriting. Fuck, that's so crazy, dude. And I was like, no. <laughs> it doesn't do anything interesting with it. It's not like Mr. Robot, where that, that, that twist in Mr. Robot, the idea that they're the same person, takes up the whole thing, and, and they do so much with it. Uh, in this, it was just kind of like a final twist at the end to, I guess, kind of bring you more into the narrator's head and make it feel more like the narrator was God the whole time, which I guess was kind of the point. And then the narrator starts to lose his memory himself because he's just kind of been overwhelmed by time and the past and everything like that. And he starts to lose his memory, and that was all fantastic. The bit at the end where it gets really sad and it really goes there, it goes to that depressing dark spot that that the book had kind of hinted at at the beginning. I loved all that. And the ending of every chapter at that point, by the end, felt like it could have ended the book and I would have been like, ooh, that was a good final line. The book was a little inconsistent, as I've said, with how it engaged me. It's not like Ninth Building, where the first half of Nine Building is like a fantastic 10 out of 10 piece of work, and then the second half isn't as good. It's, it's more like it comes in waves. The quality of the book comes in waves. And there are standout moments of this book that I will be thinking about and that I really like. But for the most part, the book was, um, uh, it stalled a little bit, it was a little too long, it felt like maybe 30, 40 pages could have been cut out, and it would have been better. I would have liked to have seen more of the modern world, I would have liked to have known the specifics of the modern world, and why the modern world is choosing to go back to the past, because we get a lot of mulling over what the world thinks of the past, uh, in specific to each country, why each country wants to go to this part, of the past, but I don't get why the countries want to do that, and I would have liked to have seen that more on the individual level, on the country level, and then on the world level. That was- that felt like the one piece that was missing, was why that malaise is there. And- and the author perhaps half-heartedly addresses that in the discussion of Alzheimer's in memory, um, but it felt like he didn't commit to that in the way that I would have wanted. And that would have only taken a couple, maybe like, 20 more pages to get to that, and then I felt it would have, um, addressed its concept, sort of, wholly. But for the most part, it felt like there was just that kind of chunk missing where everybody, all of a sudden, because the book needs its laws, everybody all of a sudden decides to go back to the past. And I was like, well, surely there'd be some people going, nah, maybe let's not do this. I needed to know why people were just immediately deciding to do that. But it fits in the magic realism logic of the book, so maybe I can forgive it, but nah. So all in all, I did like the book. It stalls a little bit. There's some sections that are uninvesting, but I love the beginning and I love the ending, even despite the twist of the ending. Um, so yeah, I'd say recommend it. It's, uh, of the shortlist so far, it's my favourite out of the shortlist, but it's still not something that I think I would ever give, like, an award to. It's not a book that I, like, adore. There's some stuff in it that, that's, that I do adore, but the book as a whole, I'm just kind of left, like, yeah, it was good. I would give an award to Ninth Building, that's something I still really love, um, and this book is not as good as that. Um, I'm going to read Whale next. And we'll see if Whale is the one that can kind of top my list. Spoilers, I've read the first 40 or 50 pages and I fucking love it, so we'll see if it can manage that. Um, but, yeah, so that's where we're at right now. We've done five of the six, we've got one more left, and then I guess we'll have a, a, we'll have a winner. And that winner will probably be stillborn, and I'll be pissed. So, thank you all for watching, I hope you've enjoyed uh, my review. It was a little haphazard and fragmented, but that is how memory is. I am trying to mirror the book and its style. It was actually an intelligent, artistic decision for my review to be a piece of shit. So I just hope you know that.